concerned with artifact handling methods for mobile or stationary uh, EEG data. And today I want to talk about one very specific method, which has been mentioned before. I'm very lucky it, it gets more prominent over the time. Uh, and so, yeah, interrupt me at any time if you have any questions, and I'm also around uh, afterwards uh, to talk about this. Um, so, yeah, let's first talk about a little bit about artifacts. Um, so, as you know, EEG, and especially mobile EEG, is prone to many, many different artifacts. Um, and they are, I guess, roughly uh, dividable into two categories. So, there are artifacts like heartbeat, muscle, movement, and eye movement, which I would say are internal or biological artifacts, or signals, depending on whether you want to call them artifacts or not. Uh, and the other guys are technical artifacts, and those guys I would definitely call artifacts because they are probably not correlated with your experiments so much. They are not internal signals at all. They are external signals. Those guys are electrode displacement, cable movement, things like that. And those biological and technical artifacts are very, very different in their handling. The biological artifacts can be modeled quite well with many existing methods, whereas the technical artifacts, the modeling of those things are, is very different and uh, much more complicated than this, uh, than the biological artifacts. And uh, much in the very same manner, so I like to categorize the things that I'm working with, uh, you can also categorize artifact uh, handling methods. And so there are artifact handling methods which I would call online. Uh, they are fast, they are working during the measurement, and they are automatic if you want. And then there are other uh, artifact correction or handling methods which I would describe as offline. Those are slower in the, in the uh, definition they use more data. So you would use those on the measurement. Once you have collected all your data, you run your models uh, through those data. And secondly, uh, artifact handling methods can be un unsupervised. This means they are automatic, they do not need user input, they do not need labels, uh, or they are supervised in the definition that they need labeled data, or that they even use or need manual input, like the uh, collection or definition of specific ICA components, which is many times done manually. And then uh, the artifact handling methods can either work on single channel data or they benefit from multi-channel data depending on what their mathematical properties are. And today I want to, uh, as I said, talk about a very specific artifact handling method. It's called artifact subspace reconstruction and it has a collection of properties and uh, those I highlighted those here. So it's an online method and while it is working during the measurement without any user input, it initially needs labeled clean calibration data. So it is a supervised method. And also it benefits from multi-channel, so it's not a single channel method, but it can deal with uh, a very low amount of channels. Uh, artifact subspace reconstruction, we have seen this picture before. Uh, it has not been developed by me, it has been developed in the SWORD Center, mainly by Christian Kote, uh, Tim Mullen and other great people working there. And uh, in their original publication they had this very handy overview. Uh, so Maybe you already know what's up now, but uh, in case you're lost like me when you see this picture, uh, I will now walk you through the different steps uh, of artifact subspace reconstruction. Okay, first of all, I told you it's a supervised method. Um, so what you need first is calibration data. Um, this calibration data needs to be from your respective subject in the condition that you want to use ASR in. So if you have a walking condition and a sitting condition, do record calibration data in both conditions separately because ASR will benefit from a very good uh, definition of normal data. Uh, those calibration data need to be one minute at least and uh, needs to be from the subject that you want to use the method on. Uh, on this calibration data, ASR is computing a statistical model and I won't go into the details of the single steps now, but what it basically does is compute, computes a covariance matrix, which is a channel-by-channel -channel symmetric representation of your current EEG data. It will then compute a mixing matrix very similar to the unmixing matrix that you might know from ICA. It will decompose this mixing matrix and will then compute statistical properties in the decomposed space, in the component space. Uh, these statistical properties are very basic things like the mean or the standard deviation, RMS values, things like that. And these values are saved in a threshold matrix. Afterwards, when you want to apply ASR to your data, this very statistical model that you trained before 
is applied to the uncorrected data that you will find in your experiment. So you can imagine ASR as taking a chunk of your data, you throw your statistical model at it, it does beautiful things, and in the end it will come up with corrected data, which will have the same channel number and the same samples, it won't discard any samples, but those corrected data are theoretically artifact-free. And this is how it works. The statistical model that is being, so the, I'm sorry, the threshold matrix that we computed on the clean calibration data is the only thing that is being carried into the processing part. And during the processing, uh, the steps in the computation are very similar to the calibration phase. You again compute a sample covariance matrix, this time of your uncorrected data. This covariance matrix potentially contains the representation of an artifact because your segment of your data <coughs> might contain an artifact. This covariance matrix is decomposed again and the assumption that ASR uses is that in statistical subspace, artifacts will be very deviant from normal data. They induce huge amounts of variance in your data and therefore they will show by having huge, enormous eigenvalues, if that is something which tells you anything, uh, by comparison to normal EEG data. After this decomposition where your artifact is showing very prominently, uh, you choose the clean components. So you say, okay, my first three components, they are very deviant, I don't know, they could contain an artifact. So you only keep the rest of the components, which might reflect normal. The rest, like normal in the uncorrected data, the parts which do not contain the artifact. And those clean components are used to reconstruct the current data segment. And uh, yeah, as you can see, corrected data is the uh, result of this uh, whole step. And as you also maybe see, is that the core step, this is always the first thing that happens, and this is the most important thing, is the computation and the decomposition of the covariance matrices of the EEG. And covariance matrices of EEG, or covariance matrices in general, uh, they do have certain statistical um, properties. And uh, one of those properties is that they are, by definition, symmetric, positive, definite matrices. And that doesn't have to tell you anything, but uh, let me just tell you one thing. Those matrices, by definition, lie in a curved space. And this is now the representation of a, a square matrix in a 3D case, right? So this is a three-dimensional, um, um, sorry, a three-dimensional uh, space that I just made up here for uh, plotting purposes. If you would work with EEG data, obviously your channel space would be channel by channel, so you cannot really display that anymore. But you can imagine the properties are the same. And uh, if you would now want to compute the distance between two points in this curved space, I would tell you, okay, is this thing here, which might reflect a component in the covariance matrix that you just computed, which might contain an artifact, is this component far away from this component or not? Then the distance between those points is very precisely described by a curve, whereas any straight line would only be an approximation of the true distance. This is very much the same as if I would ask you now, how far away is, is New York from here? And you would give me the distance from here through a tunnel through Earth. Then this distance would be quite short. It would, it would be shorter actually than going above the Earth's surface, because you would describe a curvature there. And this, uh, this analogy holds for EEG data. So if I would tell you, Artifactual components, they need, to be, they need to be detected in terms of their distance, <coughs> in terms of their distance, in terms of how far away are they from normal data. And if I can see this clearly, uh, then I can detect those artifacts and can correct them. Otherwise, I won't detect them. And uh, all these things are called Riemannian geometry. You might have heard of it. It has a growing research body in the EEG community. Um, and there I just listed some names which... Uh, I have read up in my PhD quite a lot. So what we did is we added this Riemannian thing to ASR. And I'm going to show you now some results. So what you see here is an eye blink. Uh, so here, uncorrected data, you see the eye blink, it's a huge magnitude, and you also see in the topography the normal spatial, the expected spatial distribution of an eye blink. And in the middle, you see ASR corrected data. And what is visible, like on the first glance, is that the spatial distribution is still preserved. You still see uh, that there is a residuum of an eye beam. You also see that in the time course. So you can see the amplitude is diminished by an order of magnitude. It's very small, but still it's a very, you can see that it's an eye beam. And in Riemannian ASR data, 
we do see a similar pattern in the time course. We do, we do see here, yeah, this might be a residual ibuprofen. It might also be something different. It might be in a residual ibuprofen, though. But in the topography, you see that it looks very different. And I don't want to say that this is necessarily better. I just uh, want to show you that this is what remaining in ASR does. And whenever you look at an artifact correction method, uh, if I would tell you now, okay, I develop an artifact correction method and what it, the only thing it does is compute a flat line in your data, then your artifact would be gone, right? So if you would compute an eye blink afterwards, you say, oh yeah, perfect, this is a flat line, the eye blink is gone. But what is also gone is your signal of interest. And because of that, we did not only look at an artifact, but we also looked at a signal of interest in the same data. So this is the same data sets. Uh, people were walking or standing outdoors, and they were holding a smartphone. And I would present uh, words to them. They would have a certain task to memorize those words. Stefan was talking about that in his talk. And uh, those presented words are static visual stimuli. They are known to elicit a visually evoked potential. So what you see here, even in uncorrected data, is a very beautiful visually evoked potential on the group level. The gray lines are the subject level. And you also see in the topography the expected distribution. Uh, yeah. And then in the ASR data, as well as in the Romanian data, you see that the variability across subjects is decreased, but the spatial distribution as well as the overall morphology of the BEP is preserved. So the message of this slide is just whether you use ASR or Romanian ASR, uh, the VEP signal is preserved. You do not lose much of the amplitude. You also do not lose much of the signal-to-noise ratio. And everything that I have shown you right now was kept data. So now we come to the secret data, and maybe this tackles some of the um, parts of the question that Klaus had to uh, Martin, whether ICA decomposition would work on the secret, right? So this is now secret data, and if we look at the left plot, this is data that Boyana collected. People were sitting in the lab and we computed CAP together with secret. And they had the task for the left plots was that they would clench their draw as tightly as possible. And what you see then is in the spectrum an overall high power on all frequencies because this is known to be elicited by muscle artifact. In the spectrum you see that everywhere. And what you especially see are those peaks <coughs> here. One of them is line noise. And the other one is a distinct peak of this very tiny masseter muscle that you have here in your jaw if you clench that. And when you compare that to Riemannian data, you see that the overall power is decreased, and uh, also these two peaks, the line noise and the masseter muscle peak, are gone. The two right plots, uh, again, this is an artifact, and the two right plots are describing a signal. And the two right plots here are describing uh, an alpha oscillation. So what you see is people were sitting in the lab again with the secret, and I would just or Boyana would ask them to close their eyes. And we all know that then uh, alpha power increases. And this is visible here. This is a, um, a peak in power on alpha. And you see that in Romanian corrected, Romanian ASR corrected data as well as in uncorrected data. Uh, I do refrain from interpreting these topo plots. So, uh, yeah, just look at them. But uh, I wouldn't really, <laughs> I wouldn't know what to expect. Uh, yeah, okay. And yeah, Martin and other people were making the point that we do need these analyses uh, online, we do need these analyses on the smartphone, this is all nice and well that we have an online method, but if it only works on a PC, then what are really our options? So we really want to have a backpack and then walk with people outdoors? I don't know, maybe not. Uh, so maybe we want to go mobile, and um, maybe some of you know my framework Scala, I developed that a few years ago. Um, and I included a very preliminary beta version of ASR into Scala. And I also have preliminary data, I don't have those with me, but I can show you plots if you want to see them later. Um, it is working, and I can also tell you that the guys from Membrane Train are working to include ASR as well in their desktop application as also in their Android application very soon. So you can expect great things. Uh, yeah, everything that I showed you today is open source, you can download that, uh, you can find all the bugs and then uh, tell me about them. Try this out. I heard that we have the tryout guy here in the audience, uh, so maybe you can try this on his data. Uh, I appreciate every feedback that you have, and that's it from me. Thank you very much. Thanks, Sarah. That is that was most interesting, and we are actually going to uh, to continue in the same uh, direction, and you can actually stay with us to play with ASR. Awesome. Great. During the hands-on, yeah. Um, 
Uh, thank you. Um, I'm, uh, I like everything you showed uh, <laughs> on screen, but uh, I, I already tried the ASR and some data. Uh, and what I'm just thinking, given that you go mobile, uh, what about this one minute calibration phase? Yeah. Um, and also with your Riemannian, does it have additional benefits or n not in that aspect? Yeah. Uh, okay, so two part question. Um, first part, yes, the calibration data and online experiments uh, need to be thought before you, you start your experiment. So what we do is we would collect calibration data before we would go start anything. We would just, I don't know, sit them down or place them on your bicycle and just ask them not to move but just sit there and then collect the data. Um, the training of the model is, is that's working in milliseconds, so you won't even recognize. It's just uh, like you can give a small notification to people that now the statistical model is being computed and please hold on, and that's already it. Um, and then to your second question, yes, Romanian ASR has another benefit. It is quicker. It only takes a third of the time of original ASR, um, which is mostly interesting if you use it offline. So if you use it like ICA in the end, if you have computed all your data and you put all your data into the method, then Romanian ASR will only take a third of the time. But at the same time, this is something which I did not tackle at all, uh, both ASR and Romanian ASR are very sensitive to the specific parameters that you choose when calling those. And Romanian ASR even more so. Um, so it's very important that you choose the right parameters, which is at the same time currently a problem because we do not have an objective evaluation of parameters. But we desperately need one also for ASR. Thank you very much. I'm getting back to the second part of the mic, Mafia. Um, I, I, I do really like the approach, um, but I always have stomach ache. And, and you, you express it quite nicely. It might be a residual blink, it might be pocket activity. Why don't you model ground truth to see what your method actually does instead of taking real data where we have no idea where it comes from? Yeah, yeah good idea. We should do that. <laughs> That's right. That's just the short answer. Well, there are benefits to using data that you have, uh, and we yeah, we can. Yeah, because where it comes from. So yeah, just oh, you're right. Create the data, create your sources, and then you know what you remove and yes. what you don't. Yeah. I don't have any defense. That sounds good. <laughs> Let's uh, thanks uh, Zara once again, and actually. Um, while we set things up, 